their job. You know what? My heart is, is tremendously encouraged as I go over these prophecies in detail because it, it's amazing. The prophecies in Scripture are fulfilled precisely. Our, our God is, is not just like, well, yeah, that's close enough. No, they are filled precisely. And so I am just excited to be able to share with you the 70-week prophecy tonight. But before we begin, please, would you mind just taking a moment? Let's bow our heads in prayer, asking God's blessing. Father in heaven, indeed, um, you are an awesome God. You're a God of love, of justice, of mercy. And Lord, we're just so thankful that you have given us these prophecies so that we can know that you are in charge. You are in control of the world events. And even though Satan is opposing, Satan is trying to divert and distract and destroy, your ultimate purposes are being fulfilled precisely. And Lord, we're just so thankful tonight that again, we can look at our Bibles, we can open them, we thank you for them, and we pray for an outpouring of your spirit that we might hear and see and understand, and more important than that, that we can embrace Jesus, our Savior, even more tightly. Bless us tonight, I pray in Jesus' name, and all the God's people said, Amen. Thank you so much for joining me in prayer. So tonight, the arrival of the Prince... The 70-week prophecy, and of course we're talking about Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. Now how many of you consider yourselves to be good students of Bible prophecy? Okay, there's a few people who've spent some time studying Bible prophecy. Well, I am hoping and praying tonight, not because of anything that I can bring to the table, but I am hoping tonight that you will have an even better understanding, regardless of how much time you spent studying Bible prophecy, that when you leave tonight, you will have learned a great deal more than you knew before, by the grace of God. Amen? Amen. The arrival of the prince. Of course, I'm not talking about the Duchess of Cambridge, nor the prince of Cambridge, uh, which she is holding here, but that was a pretty nice picture. I mean, you kind of get the point. It's someone important, the arrival of the prince. And again, we go back just to kind of recap where we were. Uh, last evening, we went over what happened in the Garden of Eden when God had given a very simple test of loyalty, one that was easily understood, asking Adam and Eve not to eat off of just one tree in the Garden of Eden. They failed the test, they ate the fruit, distrusting God, and that brought sin on just, not just Adam and Eve, but on all of their descendants. We all have inherited this predisposition to not trust God, but to trust ourselves, to trust our intellect, or sometimes trusting our emotions. Is trusting your emotions a good thing to do, yes or no? Ooh. We could spend the rest of the evening swapping stories about the one time when we trusted our emotions rather than allowing God's spirit to direct us. And what did it do? Well, I don't know about you, but my testimony is it got me in big trouble. Oh, there's so much I'd like to rewind. Well, I'm so thankful that God did not leave Adam and Eve just to die from the choice they made. But God gave a beautiful promise. It's recorded in Genesis 3.15. We've been over this promise, but we're going to look at it again. Genesis 3.15, where God gives a promise to Adam and Eve, addressing Adam and Eve, and of course Satan as well. They're all standing there in God's presence. And God says, and I, that is God, will put enmity, that's hostility, between you, Satan, and the woman, that is the church, and followers of God's rescue plan. It's just a little hot on the mic. Can you just bump it down just one notch? Thanks very much, Leonard. Between the woman, the church are the followers of God's plan, the plan of salvation, and between your seed, that is the followers of Satan, and her seed. Now that word is capitalized in my New King James Version because that seed is referring to someone specific, and that someone is Jesus Christ. And he, that is Christ, shall bruise, that is crush Satan's head. And you, Satan, shall bruise, impede his, that is Christ, heel. And so God is giving a, a promise here in Genesis 3.15 that he's going to bring about the ultimate 
sacrifice, the ultimate rescue plan for human beings. And I'm sure that Adam and Eve, when they heard this promise, they assumed that this promise would be fulfilled very soon. And, and I'm sure that when Adam and Eve had their first child, uh, they, who they named Cain, they were expecting maybe that Cain was going to be the promised one, the, the one who would come to provide an ultimate sacrifice for sin. But that didn't happen. Now, we, we're just going to jump ahead, and I just want to say this. John, when he saw Jesus walking on the, on the planet nearly 4,000 years later, John, when he saw Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, John said he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, and again, this is the Holy Spirit speaking through him, Behold, or look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. You know, Adam and Eve would have probably been very discouraged. And I'm sure many of God's followers after Adam and Eve would have been very discouraged if they had known how long it was going to take before the promised Messiah came. And so what I want to do now is just go through a very, very brief overview of some of the events that happened between the Garden of Eden until when Jesus actually came, the fulfillment of the promise that God made in Genesis 3.15. And I want to say this, it's only in the context of understanding that God promised that he was going to give his son as an ultimate sacrifice. It took divine intervention all of the time, all down through those 4,000 years in order for God to fulfill his promise to send a savior. And Satan was there at every turn to try and oppose. Satan did everything. He pulled out the stops to make sure that the savior would never be born. Can you imagine if God did not have a people on earth, could he have sent his son to some wicked nation and have his perfect son be born in a wicked nation and have the people listen to him? It would have never happened. They would have written him off. So God had to have a people who had a a vi an understanding of the light of heaven, who were faithful in following God. He had to have a people to provide a community that his son could be born in and grow up in. But it took divine intervention for it to happen. Divine intervention. We go again back to the Garden of Eden in the process of time. It came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground to the Lord, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering. Why did God respect Abel and his offering? Because God had told specifically both to Adam and Eve and to their children exactly what type of sacrifice was acceptable to him. Again, very clear, very simple instructions. But it says that Cain offered what seemed right for him. How often we as human beings want to just give God what we think is okay, rather than understanding what God requires. Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock, again, fulfilling precisely the parameters that God had given. And it says, and the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Okay, God, I brought what I thought was good enough, and you're not putting your blessing on it. How did God put his blessing on it? He answered by fire down on the sacrifice that met his specification. And that was the offering that Abel gave. Now Cain talked with, so Cain wasn't just upset about this. He saw that Abel was someone who was exactly opposite of him. And so there was, remember what God said? To Satan, he would put enmity, that is hostility, between the followers of God and those who followed Satan. Isn't that what God said? There's going to be enmity. There's going to be hostility. They're not going to get along. And we see it being played out, this prophecy being fulfilled in the first human being that was born to Adam and Eve. Now, Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and did what? He killed him. Imagine that. The very firstborn of Adam and Eve becomes a murderer. How quickly rebelling against God gets you in huge trouble. You know what? Apart from the power of God, any of us have the capacity to be a murderer or some other criminal. We have that capacity. As a matter of fact, John Wesley said it so well when he was told about the moral failings of someone who was in the church. He says, but for the grace of God, there go I. 
there go I. You see, there's no safety except trusting what God has said, trusting his love and his provision. So we see a huge divergence between the followers of Cain and the followers of Abel. Cain representing those who followed Satan and Abel, those who followed God. There was a splitting of the road. You were either going to go one way or the other. And by the way, things have not changed in the last nearly 6,000 years. It has not changed at all. And so we see the descendants of Cain and the descendants of Seth, who was the son that came after uh, Abel was killed, another child of Adam and Eve. And Seth was someone who believed God, trusted God, followed God, obeyed God. And these are the descendants. But we see very quickly that as these individuals had families, as they spread out, we see a huge divergence. We see most of the people on the earth following after Satan rather than following God. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, God said, after nearly a thousand years, 1,500 years, he said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. And so God said, you know what God is saying here? Unless I intervene, wickedness has become so rampant, so quickly, that unless I intervene, there will never be a possibility of the Savior coming. Everyone on the earth will be corrupted. And there will not, I will not be able to pull off my plan. And so God had an emergency plan. And that emergency plan was called what? It was called the flood. It was called the flood. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil. How often? Continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth. And was grieved in his heart. Because God saw that Satan was going to arrange things and, and so capture men's heart and so, so pollute men's hearts that God would not be able to fulfill his Genesis 3.15 prophecy and promise of a coming Savior. Notice it says, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with what? Is there any similarities between what the world was like before the flood and what we see on the earth right now is there any similarities yes jesus said it so well in matthew 24 he said as it was in the days of noah so shall it also be in the coming of the days of the son of man same thing but it, genesis 6 8 but who found grace in the eyes of the lord there was one man in particular who whose heart was was perfect toward god whose whose heart was loyal to god and that's why Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Simply, it's not that Noah was better than anyone else. It's just that Noah listened to God and lovingly obeyed God. That's the difference. He found grace. You know the story. God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is, is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them from the earth. And he said, do what? Make a boat. And so God, did God just sneak the flood in and people didn't know about it? I tell you what, my heart goes out to Noah. I mean, Noah was the, the least successful evangelist I've ever heard of. He preached for what? 120 years. How many converts did he have? Only, only his three sons and their wives and, and his wife. That was it. The Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. And so the flood came, and how much did the flood destroy? Everything. Except I wonder about the fish. But I won't, I'll let you think about that for a while. Okay, so after the flood, Noah had his three sons, and they are the ones that replenish the earth. We have Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And it was only through Shem that the knowledge of God was preserved. Ham and Japheth walked away from, even though they had that, the, this miracle of being saved on the ark, even though that miracle was there, they still rebelled against God, and their descendants rebelled against God, and they got worse and worse and worse. But through the descendants of Shem, God preserved a knowledge 
of his love, his mercy, and his plan to one day send the promised Messiah. And so then these other descendants of, of uh, Noah, some of them went, and one of those descendants was a man by the name of Nimrod. He was a very brilliant man, a very capable, very gifted individual. And uh, he went and built a number of cities, and one of those cities was called the Tower of Babel. He, Nimrod built this city, and his descendants built this tower. And what they said in building this tower, they said, you know what, even though God, you know, we kind of heard that he had a promise he wasn't going to destroy the earth by a flood, we don't really trust God. You know, really can we believe that? And so they decided they were going to build this tower that would reach to heaven. So that if God ever sent another flood, they could be high enough above it that they would they would actually be able to survive. But it's interesting that we call the Tower of Babel, we call it Babel, and we, we understand that it meant confusion. It certainly was these individuals were confused over the character of God and, and uh, God's purposes. But you know, actually, that word Babel, Babel, you know what it actually means? It means gate of God or gate to God. Rather than trust God and his promises, these individuals said, you know what, we are going to, we're going to build something that is going to become our portal to reach God. It's man trying to save himself versus trusting God to save them. Babel, gate of God. And of course, we know the story how that God, when he saw what was going on there, there had been one universal language. God came down and he... Uh, bless them with different languages so that suddenly you know the day before they were all talking in well I, I don't want to say English I mean my friends who are Hispanic swear that the heavenly language is is Spanish and I don't know maybe that's true but maybe they were all speaking Spanish one day but then the next day you had people who were speaking Chinese and and individuals that were speaking German and, and individuals that were speaking English. But the point is, I don't know what they were speaking, but suddenly no one could understand one another. And then those people who seemed to have the same language hung out, and so it dispersed all those people at the Tower of Babel. It was after this time, much, actually quite a bit after this time, that the Bible record tells us that God called a man by the name of Abraham. Abraham lived in Ur of the Chaldees, now in present-day Iraq, and God called him out of his country, and Abraham packed up and moved his family, even though God didn't tell him exactly where he was going. He trusted God so much, he said, God, you told me to move, I'm packing my bags, and you'll, you'll let me know when I get to the right place. Abraham packed up, he went to Haran, which is in present-day Turkey, and there he stayed a while, and then God called him out. You know the story how God uh, led him out of Haran, down into the area of current-day Palestine. Uh, you know some of the stories of what happened to Abraham along the way. You know how God had promised that Abraham would have a, have a son, that Abraham would, would be blessed, and he would be the father of a great nation. And you know the story how Abraham and Sarah... Um, they heard the promise that God made, but they were getting older and older <laughs> and older until all human hope was lost because no one as old as they were had ever had children. And so Abraham and Sarah, Sarah actually came up with this great plan to help God out. You know how that went, how that Sarah gave uh, Hagar, her handmaid, to be Abraham's wife, and she... Abraham went along with the plan, and uh, Hagar, of course, got pregnant and had a son, but that was not the son of promise, and it's kind of a tragic story. I mean, no one likes to read that part where Hagar was sent away out of the camp, but God said, that was not my plan. You know what? There are consequences when we try to outsmart God, when we try to somehow impose our human wisdom into what God has clearly said that he himself alone will do. There are consequences when we do that, and that certainly is part of that story. Abraham, of course, came down to the, 
to the area of Palestine. God said, I'm going to give this land to you. This is going to be your land. You know how the story went uh, that ultimately God fulfilled his promise to give them a son when Abraham was 100 years old. And his wife was how old? 90. 90 years old. Now, I have a colleague, a good friend of mine by the name of Tom Dodge. And uh, I, I actually, I get respect just by telling people that I know Tom Dodge. You know why? Because Tom Dodge, just a couple of years ago, he got married. He, he had been married before. His wife passed to her rest from cancer. And he was single for, oh, nearly 20 years. But he got remarried, and uh, his new wife is a younger, younger than Tom Dodge. But just a couple of years ago, Tom Dodge had his first child when Tom was 60 years old. Well, I don't know about you. You do the math. I tell you what, when uh, this daughter of his is ready, if, if God doesn't, if Jesus doesn't come, uh, and she graduates from high school, oh, oh, well, I won't go into that. You can figure it out. But Abraham and the miracle that God performed through giving him a son by the name of Isaac is an amazing. You know, Isaac, what, what's so significant about Isaac? Did he do anything great? I mean, you look at the biblical record. Actually, Isaac doesn't do anything tremendous but what's special about Isaac is that he was the son of promise that is what's special about Isaac and then Isaac had two sons Jacob and Esau we know that story how Jacob and Esau didn't get along very well how that Jacob's mother uh, Rebecca had uh, had a plan to make sure that God's purposes were again fulfilled. And any time there's human intervention, human effort to try and make God's promises come true on your own, there's a big problem. There's a huge problem. And we know that that uh, Abraham, I mean that uh, Jacob and Esau really had uh, major, major issues. God had said that the younger would serve the older. The mom intervened to make sure that happened. And it created big problems. Jacob had to leave home. He never saw his mother again alive. But then he did come back after spending more than 20 years away at his uncle Laban. He comes back. He's got, he's got not one wife, but he's got by this time, I think, four wives. Again, was this God's plan for, for a person to have that many wives? You guys, you can't answer that question. No, it messed things up, and there were huge problems. I mean, the sons of Jacob, did they get along great? No, they did not, because some of them were from this mom, and some of them were from this mom. And by the way, Jacob really loved only one of them, and who was that? Well, he, he, that was his son that he really loved, but the problem is that he loved one wife a lot more than the others. And you know what? The kids could pick up on that kind of stuff, can't they? They can see that one is being favored over the other. And so there were rivalries in Jacob's sons, huge rivalries. We know that, well, that's kind of jumping ahead. We know that one of those sons uh, got sold into slavery, and that was Joseph. Joseph was one of Jacob's sons. And uh, Joseph went down to Egypt as a slave. We know that story, how God intervened, and when, even though he was given a great job. Uh, he was put in a precarious situation because the lady of the house took a real fancy to him. He tried, he remained true to God. And Satan saw a fit to it that he got thrown into prison. God turned it around. And Joseph uh, is brought out at a specific time because Joseph has been empowered by God to understand and interpret dreams. We know Pharaoh had that dream. You know that dream. Uh, God gave Pharaoh, letting him know that there was going to be a famine. And uh, Joseph interpreted those dreams for Pharaoh. He's made the prime minister. So now one of the sons of Jacob is the prime minister of the most powerful nation on the earth. Amazing story. Amazing story. And of course, we know how Joseph's brothers uh, came down to Egypt to buy corn during time of famine. It was even in the land of Canaan. They came there to buy. And there they get hooked up with their brother, although they don't know it at the time. You know that story, how... Uh, Joseph tested them to see if they were still, um, if they were still as hard-hearted and cold as they were when he grew up with them. And he found out that their hearts had been changed, and then they had a re 
they were reunited they 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 hugged each other and during that time period not only did god provide for egypt and the people there but also for the people of canaan and surrounding areas he provided them with corn with food to eat during horrible horrible famine and because of again because of joseph and his close relationship and how the Pharaoh, the monarch of Egypt, saw that the spirit of God was on him. He made him his prime minister. And Joseph actually became a very well-known, I mean, a very important, not just important, but but incredibly well-known person. But then after a while, a Pharaoh arose who did not know Joseph. And all these people now from from Joseph's brothers were living in Egypt. They were living in Egypt, and they'd been there for a long time. And the Pharaoh, the new Pharaoh, figured out that these people were going to be stronger than his people. And so he said, the way to control these foreigners who are now living within my borders, I'm going to make them slaves. And so the king of Pharaoh, the monarch of Egypt, made them slaves, and they dwelt in the land for 400 years. Now, they weren't slaves for 400 years. They just lived in Egypt for 400 years. But part of that 400 years, they were made slaves. And certainly the last part, that's what happened. Of course, because they were being sorely oppressed, God intervened again to make sure that there would be his people through which he could give the Messiah. Again, God intervening in the affairs of men to bring about this most important prophecy. We know how Moses was born, born to slaves in Egypt. Uh, Pharaoh had decreed at this time that all the male children born to the Israelites should be put to death. Uh, Moses' mom, uh, Jochebed, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, decided since she had just given birth to a new baby boy that the only way to preserve him was to put him in a basket. We know that story, how he was floating among the reeds, his sister watching him. When the princess, uh, one, one of Pharaoh's daughters, came down to the water, found this basket floating in there, had her handmaids bring it over, and there she sees this beautiful child, and she falls in love with it. And so she takes it as her own, but she's kind of smart. She's very smart. She knows that she can't just bring him into court. So she looks around for someone to take care of this little boy for her. Amazingly enough, God works it out so that Moses' own mother takes care of her son until he's of age. And then he goes to court there in Egypt. An amazing, beyond amazing story. So Moses... Now being raised in the court of Egypt, he figures, he, he senses that he has been called to such a time as this. That God is indeed going to use him. He knows his Hebrew background, he, his Hebrew lineage, legacy. And so Moses decides one day when he sees um, an Egyptian taskmaster beating one of the, Egyptian, one of the uh, Hebrew slaves... He decides to intervene. He kills the Egyptian, thinking that no one has seen him, buries him in the sand, and, of course, the Hebrew is spared. The next day, he's out again. He sees two Hebrews fighting, and he says, Hey, you guys, you should knock. You're brothers. Why are you fighting? And one Hebrew says to Moses, Who made you a ruler over us? Are you going to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? Moses knows the story's out and so he runs into hiding he runs out of egypt he doesn't stop running until he's on the backside of a burning desert and there he ends up meeting a family and uh, this family happens to be shepherds and uh, so he ends up taking care of sheep he ends up marrying the daughter of this family and one day god speaks to him through the burning bush calls him out of the burning side of this desert back into the mix of things sends him to egypt and has him intervene and there moses we know the 10 plagues that god uses amazing beyond amazing story how god through these 10 plagues releases the children of israel who are indeed slaves he leads them out without an army without a fight It took an amazing amount of intervention. I tell you what, that guy Pharaoh was one hard man. You read that story, you come away with with a profound um, 
profound feeling of how hard Pharaoh's heart really was. God uses Moses to take his people out of the land. We know that at Sinai, God gives the children of Israel his law again. Of course, we see that law as something, you know, bad. God, you know, uh, I think we watch too much of uh, the old uh, Ten Commandments movies, you know. We have this idea, you know, that, that that's how God really was. But God gave a law of love. We see the commandments put in a negative sense. But really in the positive sense, the Ten Commandments are God's perfect law, again, of love protecting our relationship between us and God and protecting relationships of those around us. They were given uh, to, through Moses to the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. There God reveals himself through the sanctuary service, through the Shekinah glory. An amazing, if you read uh, the accounts of what that sanctuary service was like, it was just God revealing to us and to the Israelites, of course, exactly what it was going to be like, what it was going to cost in order for God to save mankind, in order for God to be able to forgive us legally, because God either had to change the law, do away with it, or he had to satisfy the law. And of course, to do away the law would be to put the entire universe in chaos, because there would be then no law to govern anyone. And so his law could not be changed because really God's law is nothing more than expression of his character. God could no more change his law than he could change his own character. So God had to satisfy the demands of law that the wages of sin is death. And there is only one who could do that. And it had to be the law giver. It was Jesus Christ himself who revealed himself to Moses, who gave him the Ten Commandments. He was... It says in some places, the angel of the Lord, but it actually is Jesus Christ himself who was in the cloud over them by day and in the pillar of fire at night. It was Jesus who was following the children of Israel through the wilderness experience, and there he protected them, he guided them, he provided for them food from nothing. If you read the account, it says that in 40 years, their sandals didn't wear out. Now, I tell you what, Nike makes some pretty good stuff, but they got nothing on sandals that have been blessed by God. Amen? Amen. Nothing at all. In Exodus 19, God's saying through Moses, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you on what? Eagle's wings brought you to myself. You see the relational part of what God is doing here in freeing them from Egypt, slavery? I brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of what? Priest and a holy nation. You know, God's purpose when Adam and Eve were put on this earth is that we would be a kingdom of kings and priests, that we would judge Satan and his angels for their rebellion in heaven. That was God's purpose. And you know what? God's purpose has never changed. And God promised that through the children of Israel, he was going to make them a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And by the way, we saw the text, I used it just last night, where God actually promises that those people who are privileged to go to heaven with him will be a kingdom of priests and kings. God's purposes never, ever change. Now, this is in Deuteronomy 28, which the book of Deuteronomy, as we know, is essentially Moses' last address to the children of Israel. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses, through the power of the Holy Spirit, says, Now it shall come to pass, if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you on high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed you shall be in the city. Blessed shall you be in the country. That's a good blessing, right? No matter where you're living, you're going to be blessed if you will obey me. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, and the offspring of your flocks. God's going to bless everything you do from your children to whatever business you're in. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall 
you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. In other words, God says, I will intervene myself. You won't even need to fight your enemies. I'll take care of it. I'll do it. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. I mean, God's going to put, is it okay if I say the fear of God into, into the enemies? And they're going to be running away. But it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all his commandments and his statutes which I command you today that all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Now, we have this idea that God's going to pull the strings to really do nasty things, bad things to his people if they don't obey. And so we, we kind of get this idea that God says, obey or else. You know what? All that is needed for you to be cursed is to remove yourself from God's ability to bless you. He doesn't have to do anything bad to you. You're doing it to yourself. You're placing yourself where God cannot bless you, and so you are cursed. Cursed shall you be, if you don't obey. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed you shall be in the country. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your body and the produce of your land, the increase of your cattle and the offspring of your flocks. Cursed shall you be when you come in and cursed shall you be when you go out. The, law, the Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them and you shall become troublesome to all the kingdoms of the earth. You're just going to be a pain in the... Yeah. That's if you choose not to obey God. So what is the underlying message that God gives us even now if we will choose to get to know the one who loves us and respond by just choosing to love him back God has promised amazing blessings but if you remove yourself from God's ability to bless you you will be cursed and it's not me saying it I, don't shoot me I'm just the messenger boy God will bring a nation against you notice what he said to Moses, God will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language you will not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which does not respect the elderly, nor show favor to the young. God is saying, look, because I love you, I will allow, I will allow judgment to fall. But I will put meets and bounds even around that judgment. You know, do we as parents sometimes allow uncomfortable situations to happen to our children because we hate them? No. We sometimes allow consequences against our children because we love them. Don't we, parents? I know we live in a politically correct time, but there actually is a very sound biblical basis for lovingly disciplining our children now a lot of people think that means taking them out behind the woodshed and beating the tar out of them i'm not talking about that i'm just saying you need to ask god to give you wisdom as you raise your children to do the right thing for them if they rebel if they rebel and you know what god does this to us again it's because he loves us now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you the blessing and the curse which i have set before you and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you. And you return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. In other words, the discipline works. When, when bad things happen and they wake up and they're going, you know what, this, this bad stuff is happening to us because we have forsaken God. And God is saying, look, if you'll return to me, if you'll listen to my voice, if you'll repent from your rebellion, he says, you and your children... If you do that with all your heart and with all your soul, that the Lord your God will bring you back from captivity and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where the Lord your God has scattered you. There's a promise that even if they rebelled against God and they were taken away by some nation, that if they would repent, that God would bring them back. By the way, if you don't believe that's true, well, we're going to do part of it tonight. Read the account of a king by the name of Manasseh, okay? Okay, that's your, that's your homework assignment. If any of you are driven out from the farthest part in the heaven, God will gather you. Okay, I'm going to just have to skip through this. So at the very end of this address, uh, God takes Moses, his servant, up to the top of Mount Nebo. This is actually a picture of Mount Nebo. It's only 2,680 feet. It's not a really, it's not Mount Shasta. Oh, well, don't get me off on that. 
but he took him up to Mount Nebo. But actually, Mount Nebo gave a person some very unique perspective because from the top of Mount Nebo, you can see the promised land very clearly. As a matter of fact, this is from the top of Mount Nebo, and it's looking toward the promised land. And so from there, you can see the place where Jerusalem would be established. So God took Moses up there because Moses wasn't allowed to go into the promised land because what? Because Moses actually really dishonored God before all the people. And God forgave him of it, but God said, look, in order to send the message to the children of Israel that there are consequences to rebelling against me, I'm not going to be able to take you into the promised land. You're going to die on this side. But did God, did God, was God mad at Moses? No. Moses was, was God's servant, and God loved him. So he did allow him to, to experience death after he had shown him the promised land. You can read about it in the book of Deuteronomy. Moses saw the promised land. He said it was beautiful. You know the story of how God finally took the children of Israel into the promised land. Not so much because they were ready to go in the land, but because the nations who lived in Canaan at that time had filled up the cup of their iniquity. And so God had to take the children of Israel into the land of promise. But he did amazing things. We know the story of how Joshua took them there. We know about the story of Jericho and the conquest of Canaan, how God miraculously gave these nations that were fierce, that had armies, that had fortified cities and high walls and people who knew how to fight. God gave the children of Israel victory in place after place until they conquered. The conquest of Canaan took place between about 456 B.C. and 451 B.C. During those years, they conquered most of the land under Joshua's leadership. And then they settled the land. This is what the land of Canaan looked like with all the different tribes uh, with their respective land holdings within Palestine. That's what it looked like. Each tribe had their own particular area. But then it says, after Joshua died, that the children of Israel forgot about God. They started rebelling against God again. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, served Baals, and forsook the Lord God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them. And they bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. So the very thing that God warned them against doing through his servant Moses, they started doing during the time of the judges. This is the god Molech. And they believed that in order to appease Molech, they built this great iron statue of him and they, they heated up a fire and got this iron statue red hot and then they would offer their children, placing their children on the outstretched arms of this iron representation of the god Molech. And there they would sacrifice their children. I mean, how can you get that far off the path? I mean, I'm amazed. I'm really amazed. But then I have to look at today and say, look how far we as a society has gotten off the path. They provoked the Lord to anger. And so during this time, God sent judges. This is a list of the judges starting in about 1426 B.C. to about 1100 B.C., the time of the judges. And God sent these different judges. Some of them were really good and sometimes there was little bits of revival and reformation during their time and sometimes it didn't work very well you can see Othniel uh, starting it off going down through the list all the way down to Samson which we know a lot about Eli and then of course Samuel that's the time of the judges and in the time and the children of Israel this is during the time of Samuel this is the last the last judge what happened after the last judge what happened after that the time of the kings, the children of Israel said to him, look, you're old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all nations. God had warned them against even asking for a king. And now they're asking for a king. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, heed the voice of the people in all they say to you. For they have not rejected you, Samuel, but they have rejected who? They have rejected God, that I should not reign over them. So God reluctantly gave them a king. Saul, the 
first king of Israel in the United Nation. Rule for 40 years. He was good and then he was bad and then very bad. And of course, David, we know, reigned for 40 years as well. David was, he had his bumps in the road, but David was a man after God's own heart. Even though he made mistakes, he always returned to God. He confessed his sin. He was a good king, a great king. Solomon, his son, reigned 40 years after him. He started out good, and then the center part of his reign, he really got off the page. Read about that in the book of Ecclesiastes. And then at the very end, he was good again. His son Jeroboam, uh, his son Jeroboam, there's a story, you have to read it. Actually, I, I presented this uh, a couple of weeks ago during church, but... Uh, Jeroboam uh, didn't really follow the advice of his good advisors. He had followed the advice of his younger friends that he had grown up with. And, and because of that, the kingdom split because Jeroboam was going to make things even harder on Israel than they had been before. So then the, it split and Rehoboam, oh, I'm sorry, it's Rehoboam. Why am I saying Jeroboam? Someone slap me. Rehoboam was the, the son of Solomon. The kingdom split in his reign. Jeroboam. Uh, was really a bad, bad, bad king, and Rehoboam was bad mostly. And then you get into these reign of these kings in a divided nation, the kings of Israel, the northern ten tribes, and then they were in one kingdom, kingdom of Israel, and then the kingdom of Judah, which was Judah and Benjamin. And you can see all these kings. Was, was it a good time with all the kings that came after? Not really. Look at this. Bad, 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 bad. Really bad. You can read about it in... First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Things got worse and worse. Moreover, all the leaders of the priests and the people transgressed what? More and more, according to all the abominations of the nations, and defiled the house of the Lord, which he had, had consecrated in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers, rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. God tried to intervene. He let them know what they were doing was wrong. He even allowed some bad things to happen. Some nations came in and, and had war with them. There were times when they were sorely oppressed by the Midianites and sorely oppressed uh, by other nations around them, the Philistines and others. But they didn't do it. But they mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, scoffed at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people. Notice what it says here in Second Chronicles. Till what? God had done everything short of violating their power of choice and trying to wake them up. And they rebelled even more against God. Therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans who killed their young men with the sword in the house of the sanctuary had no compassion on young man or virgin, on the aged or weak. He gave them all into his hand. This is an exact fulfillment of Deuteronomy chapter 28 when God says, if you rebel against me, this is what's going to happen. This is an, this, and this is the historical account of what happened. It's an exact fulfillment of what God has spoken to them through his prophet Moses. So this is the very end of the age of the kings down to Hoshea only ruled nine years in the year 723 the Israelites the northern ten tribes go into Assyrian captivity and the kings of Judah ended up with well Jehoiakim was the last independent king Zedekiah was set up as a puppet king by King Nebuchadnezzar he rules 11 years he was really horrible and Nebuchadnezzar finally comes back after putting up with Zedekiah and all of his games for a, quite a long time. And Solomon's temple is completely destroyed in 588 B.C. Both parts, all of God's kingdom, his people are taken into captivity. Jeremiah, you have not listened to me, says the Lord, that you might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands to your own hurt. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, what does God call him? My servant will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants, and against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing, and perpetual desolations. 
Moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of bridegroom and the voice of the bride, sound of millstones and the light of the lamp. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon for how long? Wow. So God is saying that even though bad things, I'm going to allow bad things to happen to you, it's only going to last. You're going to be taken away prisoner into a foreign land. And it's only going to last for how long? Seventy years. 70 years. In the third year of the reign of Je uh, King Jehoiakim, that's when the Babylonian captivity started. It re started in 606 B.C. And that is recorded in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 1. For you historians. And so there we have this story of the young man Daniel, how God used Daniel because he was faithful. His heart was perfect toward God. And he used Daniel's three companions, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, in an amazing way in the, in the empire of Babylon. How Daniel was privileged to interpret a very important dream. We heard about that on night one, did we not? Daniel chapter 2, correct? We heard about that, how Daniel was given by God the interpretation of the dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had, how that Daniel and his three companions were promoted in the kingdom of Babylon, and there they actually were part of the ruling class underneath King Nebuchadnezzar. And it was through the young man Daniel that we have the book bearing his name, and we have some most amazing prophecies in all of Scripture recorded in the book of Daniel. So during the Babylonian captivity, Daniel has... Three major dreams, three major time prophecies. The 490-year prophecy in Daniel chapter 9, the 1260-year prophecy in Daniel 7, the 2300-year prophecy in Daniel chapter 8. And by the way, they all fit within each other. It's an amazing thing. They all fit together. It is a three-in-one time prophecy. So now Ezra 1.1. Now in the first year of King Cyrus, uh, Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. What was the word to Jeremiah? They would be in captivity for how many years? Seventy years. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom. All the kings of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me. This is the king speaking here, Cyrus. He has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who among you of all his people... May his God be with him and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. Here Cyrus is issuing a decree releasing uh, the cap captives from Judah to go back to their homeland once, a once again. The 70-year captivity began in 606 B.C. So if we subtract 70 years to go forward in history, it ended in 536 B.C., the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia. And during that decree, more than 50,000 Jews returned to the homeland, returned back to Jerusalem. Daniel is a student of Bible prophecy. He understands by reading Jeremiah that the 70 years is almost completed. Notice what he says in Daniel chapter 9. Now we're getting very close to the 70-year prophecy. In the first year of Darius, son of Ahasuerus of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through who? Jeremiah, the prophet, that he would accomplish what? Seventy years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Here it is, Daniel chapter 9. Daniel is again giving being actually given an explanation of this 70 weeks and their significance. The angel said to Daniel, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. And notice this, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. 
Now, we need to unpack and understand what is God trying to communicate in this particular passage of Scripture. Because there are some very specific and important things that God is going to accomplish during this 70-week time period, this 70-week prophecy. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. Oh, who is he talking about? Here's the prophecy that the Messiah is going to come. It's going to be within this 70-week prophecy. So from the, from the command to go to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be, what, seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. wonder why they split apart the seven weeks and the 62 weeks. We're going to find out. Hang on. So there were four decrees issued during the reign of Artaxerxes and Cyrus regarding the Jews. And so historians have tried to figure out now which one of those decrees actually fulfills the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9. It's important because if we don't get the starting point of this thing right, are we going to be able to accurately see if the prophecy was fulfilled, yes or no? It's really important to know when it started, right? Absolutely. Here they are. Under Cyrus, 536 B.C., Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, Darius in 520, Artaxerxes in 457, and again in 444 B.C. Which one is the fulfillment of the prophecy given to Daniel? Well, let's look a little bit more. So we know that 70 weeks are determined. Know therefore to, and understand that from the going forth of the command to do what? Restore. And build Jerusalem. Until Messiah the Prince. There shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And so it's important for us to understand. That this command. That was going to kick off the 70 week prophecy. Had to have. Had to fulfill certain criteria. And the criteria is. There had to be in the command. A command to restore. Restore what? Actually restore the civil rule. To give them authority. To operate as an independent city. That is the criteria that we're looking for. So we look at these four different decrees issued, and we find out that only one of them actually restores civil rule in Jerusalem for the Jewish people. And that is Artaxerxes' command recorded in Ezra chapter 7, verses 12 to 26. And if you want to write that down and go and look at that in detail, you will find that it fulfills. Ezra 7, 7, some of the children of the Israel, the priests and the Levites, the singers, the gatekeepers, and the Nephium, Nephinim came up to Jerusalem in the seventh year. That was the first decree. Well, it doesn't fulfill the, the criteria to restore. So here we go. 70-week prophecy, 70 weeks, 70 times 7 equals how many, how many days are in 70 weeks? Okay, math students, you got seven days in a week. And you times it times 70 in your little calculator, you come out with what? 490 days. Well, that doesn't sound like very long. 490 days, that would be like a year and a half or something like that. Was that going to be, does that, that doesn't seem to work. Well, the Bible tells us very clearly that in Bible prophecy, we look at timing and Bible prophecy differently than a literal days and weeks. The Bible gives us some very clear indication that in prophecy, a day in Bible prophecy e equals one literal year. Ezekiel 4.6, Numbers 14.34, both of those give us a strong indication and you know what? Sometimes people say, well, you know, that's kind of thin, Pastor. How can we really believe that? Well, let's look at some people who are considered biblical experts, okay? We have to be kind of careful. Someone told me, you know what an expert is, right? You know, an X is a has-been, a spurt's a drip under pressure. You know, and so most of the time I probably fulfilled that, those uh, definitions. But we need someone who's, you know, an expert to help us understand. Well, let's just put that in there. So this 490 days, 70 times 7 would be 490 prophetic days, which would equal 490 literal years. Now, let's look at John Gill. He's a Baptist scholar. 
He uh, was a Baptist scholar in the 18th century. Look what he says. The space of 70 weeks, looking specifically at Daniel's chapter 9 prophecy, the 70 week is not to be understood as weeks of days, which is too short a time for the fulfillment of so many events as are mentioned, nor would they fulfill within such a space of time, but of weeks of what? Years, and make up 400 and what? 90 years, within which time, beginning from the date after mentioned, all the things prophesied of were accomplished, and this way of reckoning years by days, what does he say, is not unusual in the sacred writings. You see, this is not just something we came up with. Bible scholars for literally hundreds of years have understood that in Bible prophecy, that one day in Bible prophecy equals one year in literal time. So, we know that it, this 70-week prophecy, a 490-year prophecy, came or started at the beginning of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince. So we take 70 weeks, 490 days, equals 49 years. That Remember, the prophecy is actually broken in two. There's, there's seven weeks and then 62 weeks. Do you wonder why they separated the two? Well, when you add them together, it's going to be when the Messiah would come. So in 483 years from the start of this Bible prophecy, Jesus, the Messiah, was going to come. Was this exciting news for Daniel? I bet it was. And it's exciting news for us because we get to see how precisely this was fulfilled. So here we go. So if we take the starting of this Bible prophecy from Artaxerxes' command in Ezra chapter 7 as 457 B.C., and we add the 483 years to it, we come up with 26 A.D. Oh, no. But see, that's off because 26 A.D. is not the year that Jesus was proclaimed the Messiah. It was in 27 A.D. So we made a mistake. Is the math right? 457 plus 483, is that right? Rodica, you know. <laughs> No, she's off duty. She's a math teacher. That's okay. <laughs> so, you know what? We did the math right, but somehow it's not coming out. What's the problem? So we put it on a timeline. We have a timeline here, which Rodica understands, time, I mean, number lines. We go all the way down to zero, and then we start back up on one. But here's the deal. In going from B.C. to A.D., there's no zero year. And so we go from minus one to plus one without going to a zero year. And then suddenly things come out okay because then when we do the math, 457 plus 483 plus the one since there's no zero year, it gets us to the year 27 AD, which is exactly when Jesus was anointed as Messiah at his baptism by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. We know that exactly. Isn't it amazing how it comes out? So it's, it shouldn't be amazing, but, but it is. It is amazing. Another expert, if the decree of 457 granted to Ezra himself is taken as the commencement of the 483 years, we come out to the precise year of the appearance of Jesus of Nazareth as Messiah or Christ. 483 minus 457 comes out to AD 26, but since a year is gained in the passing of 1 B.C., to AD 1, there being no such z year as zero, actually comes out to 27 AD, a most remarkable exactitude and fulfillment of such an ancient prophecy. Alexander Campbell, another Bible scholar, recognized from the going forth of the decree to rebuild Jerusalem to the baptism of Jesus was 483 years. His ministry was three and a half years, or in the middle of one week, then he was cut off, and in the half a week, that is three and a half years more, Christianity was sent to all nations. This completes the 70 weeks or 490 years of Daniel. Well, here is that timeline. It started out in 457. And now I'm going to tell you why God, in sending this information to Daniel, strips out the seven weeks and then adds in the 62 weeks. You know what, why he stripped out the seven weeks and just said that separately? He could have just said 69 weeks, but he didn't do that. He said seven weeks and 62 weeks. 
And that is because in that seven weeks, that is the time period that the, that the capital city, Jerusalem, was rebuilt. And it was built during troublesome times. And so God strips that out to let them know that was going to be the time that Jerusalem was going to be rebuilt. So did God know exactly what was going to happen? He knew exactly what was going to happen. That's exactly the amount of time it took them to rebuild Jerusalem, that 49 years. And it was a hard time. But then after that, there were 62 more weeks or 434 years, bringing us to 27 AD when Jesus was anointed at his baptism by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. And then it says that in a half a week, something else really important was going to happen. So I'm just going to give you a perspective now. It's amazing how Babylon was the nation that God used to discipline his people. They were taken into Babylonian captivity. But yet when the end of the 70 years happened, they were not under Babylon, but they were in another major world power. It's called what? Medo-Persia. 457 B.C., Cyrus and Medo-Persia. But during that 490-year prophecy, they go through the world domination of the of the nation of Greece, and it actually extends into the nation of Rome. By the time Jesus came on the scene, it was the Romans who were in power. Isn't it amazing how God took them through all these world domination, but God put his blessing on his people, and he provided the right time and the right circumstances for his son to be born because God made a promise in Genesis 3.15 that he would send a savior. And it took divine intervention, miracle after miracle, in order for God to have the right situation so that his son could be sent to this earth. But now we need to look and understand just a little bit more. So hang in there. We're just going to take a few more minutes, all right? We got this one thing. Then, he, then in Daniel, he says, then he, speaking of who? Jesus, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. And so how was that? You know, let's look at this text. It's in Matthew 26, 28. Jesus actually uh, made this statement when he was there with his disciples on that Thursday evening before he was crucified. He said, for this, this cup of juice represents, in the communion service, it represents my blood. It's the new covenant, which is shed for what? Many, for the forgiveness of sins. This was an exact fulfillment of the prophecy made in Daniel chapter 9. Exact fulfillment. That Jesus was going to allow his life to be taken. And through that sacrifice, he would establish a covenant with, how, with what? Many. Can we say amen to that? That many includes you and I tonight, by the grace of God, for the forgiveness of sins. He says also in Daniel's prophecy that he's going to bring an end to what? Sacrifice. And offering. Notice, he said he was going to cause sacrifices and oblations to cease, but not his, his covenant law. He didn't, say, he didn't say the Ten Commandments were going to be done away with. It says that sacrifices and offerings were going to cease. And that's why Paul said, circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of what? The commandments of God is what matters. Very, very clear that the commandments were not done away with on the cross. Romans 3.31, Paul says it. Do we then make void the law through faith? I mean, people want to make a big deal, says, you know, now we just have faith in God, we trust his grace, and the, and the law is done away with. Paul says, forget it. Do we make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. Again, Jesus, on, with his sacrifice, put an end to the sacrificial system. There was no need for more Innocent animals to be slaughtered, pointing forward to when he was going to come because when Jesus came, he fulfilled all of those types. Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. What happened? Then behold, the veil of the temple. You know that veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place? It was a veil that was woven in linen. It was three inches thick. You could have pulled caterpillars with that thing and it wouldn't have pulled it apart. But when Jesus died, it says the veil of the temple, separating the two compartments, was torn in two from top to bottom, showing that it was no human hand. It wasn't through human means. It was a divine hand that cut that big veil in two. And suddenly, the most holy place was exposed. 
<clears throat> exposed to the view of the priests. And it says, and the earth quaked and the rocks were split. It was a divine act, and it fulfilled exactly the prophecy made in Daniel chapter 9. He shall bring an end to the sacrifice and the offering. Now, here's the last thing. And on the wing of abomination shall one who makes desolate, shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Does anyone know what they're talking about? That's kind of confusing. Oh. Well, let's unpack this just a little bit. John says in John chapter 1 that he, speaking of Jesus, he came to his own and what happened? Did people receive Jesus? No, they rejected him. He came to his own and they did not receive him. They rejected Jesus. You know, when Jesus one day was there and, and Peter was talking to him, Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and, and I forgive him? Now, the priest had taught the mission of the spoken tradition was that you, it was a three strikes and you're out. In other words, you were only obligated as a good Jew to forgive someone three times. Like, you know, if... Uh, if someone called you fat and ugly, and uh, then they said, you know what, I was really out of, I was out of line. I'm sorry I called you fat and ugly. And you, you were bound to say, I forgive you. But if they did it three times in a row, you could say, nothing doing. Not forgiving you anymore. That was what the priest taught the people, the spoken tradition. So Peter, knowing the spoken tradition, he comes to Jesus and says, how often shall I, my brother sin against me and I forgive him? He figures, you know what, I'll double it and add one. You know, seven, the perfect number. That's got to be it. So he says, Lord, you know, if, I, if my brother sins against me, can I just forgive him up to seven times? Notice what Jesus says. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to, what is this? Seventy times seven, which equals what? Four hundred and ninety, which was the exact amount of probation time given by God to the new Jewish nation to get it right. Four hundred. You know, Jesus didn't just throw out random stuff. Jesus had a purpose, and he was directed by the Holy Spirit in everything he said. Everything. So now it says that he was going to, left, he was going to leave it desolate. That is the nation and the temple of Israel. The, the Israelites were very proud of their heritage. They were, they were very proud of their temple. But Jesus said he was going to leave it desolate. Notice what Jesus said in Matthew 23. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not what? What was the problem? Was the problem with God? No. The problem that was with the people. And then what did Jesus say? Because you have rejected me, because you have rejected me as the Messiah, your house is left to you what? Desolate. desolate. What does that word desolate mean? It means empty. It means empty. That no longer would God be in their house. And that's why when the, when the veil in the temple was torn, and suddenly they could see the most holy place. You know, if a priest went into the most holy place, except that one time of the year on the Day of Atonement, what would happen to the priest? They would immediately die. But that didn't happen when the veil was torn in two after Jesus was killed. Why? Because God's presence was no longer there. It was no longer there. Your house is left to you desolate. You see at the end of the 490 years of probation that God had given the nation of Israel to bring an end to sins, to make atonement. In other words, to stop rebelling against God. At the end of that 490 years, did the nation of Israel fulfill their part of it? Yes or no? No, they did not fulfill it. And so we see at the end of this 70-week prophecy, literal Israel, which had been chosen by God to represent him, it was taken away from them. That favored nation status ended at the 490 years. It went from literal Israel to now spiritual Israel. For those before who could only trace their lineage back to Abraham were the ones, the children of promise and all the blessing. Paul says it very clearly that now God's blessings rest on those who have the faith of Abraham. Through faith, they become the children of Israel, uh, of, of Abraham. And so it went from literal Israel to spiritual Israel at the 490-year prophecy. 
And the emphasis, which had previously been on the earthly temple, the emphasis now shifted to what? The temple in heaven. You see how it is a big, huge dividing line at the end of the 490-year prophecy. Jesus says, Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, Jews, and given to a nation bringing forth fruits thereof. Jesus is saying very, very clearly that the favored nation status that God had put on the Jews was going to be removed. There's a huge amount of interest and belief in the Christian world that we should be focused on what's happening in Israel because, you know, what happens to the Jews is actually going to be a, a, a litmus test, an indication of, of how close to the end time we are. But nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing against any of my Jewish friends, my brothers and sisters. God still, still appeals to them individually, but they have no favored nation status anymore with God. And it's actually a diversion of Satan. We'll be talking about this on a subsequent night. It's actually a diversion of Satan for people to be so focused on Israel. Really, we should be focused on what God is doing in his heavenly sanctuary and forget about what they're trying to do with the sanctuary over in Jerusalem. No disrespect to anyone. Okay, so here we go. The 70-week prophecy. In the middle of that week, Jesus was going to die. But at the very end of that probationary period, what happened? At the end of the 70-week prophecy, 34 A.D., Stephen became the first Christian martyr. What happened after the stoning of Stephen? It says in the book of Acts that after that, that through persecution, which arose at that time, that the gospel went to the whole world. That's what happened at the end of the 70-week prophecy. And so really, the question tonight, although we've seen this beautiful fulfillment of this prophecy, are you and I, under God's banner of mercy. Will we lovingly and willingly allow God to live inside of us and to write his law on our hearts so that he can con confirm the covenant with us? That's really the question tonight. Have you invited Jesus into your heart so that he can confirm that covenant with you personally? Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we are so thankful for your mercy and your grace. And we see how you were merciful from Adam and Eve all the way down to when Jesus came. How you were merciful to the nation of Israel, giving them chance after chance to fulfill the amazing prophecies and the amazing promise of blessings on them as a nation. But Lord, they failed. They rejected you. I'm so thankful, Lord, that you didn't give up, but that you sent your son, that you confirmed a covenant through him with many. But tonight, Lord, what's really important is whether we will accept Jesus into our hearts and so that he can confirm the covenant with us. And I'm praying, Father, that in the heart and mind of every person here, that they will say yes, that they will hear Jesus knocking on the door of their heart. They will open that door and Jesus promises to come into them and to dine with them, to hang out with them, to abide with them. Lord, may we choose to abide with Jesus tonight. And I pray you would bless us as we go from this place. And I pray that, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.